Good afternoon, and we are coming to you live from the National Museum of Singapore for this special edition of A Lighter Side of History, documenting a reclusive Ramadan in conjunction with the museum's Hari Raya ethnic festival celebrations. My name is Fabian, and I'll be the host for this session. Today, we have Zakaria Zainal, who was one of the photographers who was commissioned by the National Museum to document Singapore's COVID-19 experience during last, during last year's circuit breaker. His photographs and the, and the photographs and films of the other photographers and filmmakers can be seen in our special exhibition titled Picturing the Pandemic, a visual record of COVID-19 in Singapore. But first, a little more about Zakaria. He's a self-taught photographer who's very interested in telling stories about Asia. So he has done stories about the Singapore Gurkhas, as well as about the living histories of displaced people living in southern Singapore. He's also the editor of Visual Stories Asia, a space for Asia's diverse journalism. COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone, including how we celebrated and commemorated religious events and festivals. In this presentation by Zakaria, he will be sharing more about his experience of documenting the lives of the Muslim community as they observed Ramadan and celebrated Hari Raya last year in a very different manner. His photographs can be seen in the special exhibition, Picturing the Pandemic, in a section titled, A Reclusive Ramadan. If you have any questions for Zakaria, please submit them online by clicking on the pigeonhole link. We will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation during the Q&A session. Also, stay tuned for the entire session to find out more about our special giveaway. So now, I'll pass the time over to Zakaria. Okay, Zakaria, please. Okay. Hi, good afternoon everyone. So, uh, this is my first time doing a live stream. Uh, so honoured to have the museum invite me for this session and to everyone who is watching in. Thank you for taking time off your busy schedule. Um, I think, thank you so much Fabian for doing the introduction uh, on this project and uh, what it means. I think the last two, I think since um, almost one year has been quite an interesting year for everyone and I think we want to discover how this sort of like pandemic has been sort of like translated through photographers and through pictures, yeah? So uh, for me, it was doing documenting a reclusive Ramadan. And um, I was always wondering about this word reclusive. And I've always asked myself whether is it more of an inward, whether is it more of a reflective state of mind, when actually I rediscovered the word again, whereby someone who is a recluse is someone who lives in seclusion or apart from society, often for uh, religious uh, meditation. Um, and I think it's not a, a sort of like a forced reclusion. Uh, it, you know, it's not a voluntary reclusion. It's something what I feel kind of a forced reclusion, especially during this period of Ramadan where it's a period of reflection. But I'll elaborate that a bit more. I think some of you may not may see me for the first time or heard of uh, my work. So I'm just going to briefly share uh, some of the things that I photographed before. I started out my photographic career photographing the Singapore Gurkhas. Um, that was in 2011. Basically, they are men from Nepal uh, who sort of like work here in, uh, as a paramilitary unit with the police. Uh, and subsequently, I sort of like documented, um, did sort of like derivative work documenting uh, people and the community around it. So the second one was uh, postcards from Singapore. Uh, basically, children, uh, Gurkha children, who uh, in their last sort of like 10 days, 7 to 10 days before they leave Singapore, I tried to take a portrait of them and a space where they remember Singapore the most, together with a letter. Uh, I also decided to uh, create an archive of photographs uh, of the Singapore Gurkhas and their time in Singapore. It will be titled Singapore Through Their Eyes. Uh, the last two images actually can be seen in an exhibition in the National Museum. It's called Home Truly. So um, do pay a visit if you can. I think it's uh, still... Uh, uh, open for everyone to see. Yeah. I also progressed to photographing sort of like migrant workers uh, when the Little, uh, Little India riot happened in 2013. Uh, it was a collection of stories of basically people who were present within the 48 hours of uh, when it happened. Uh, it was turned into a book. And of course, there was sort of like photographs 
that uh, a project that I made with two other dear friends, uh, we call it Island Nation, basically documenting living histories of people who once lived in the islands south of Singapore. Um, finally, there's also this project called Awu Musola, whereby I photograph praying spaces, informal, uh, secular spaces turned into religious spaces uh, during the month of Ramadan, the fasting month of Ramadan. And sometimes you wonder, how sort of like this introduction, this sort of like lengthy introduction sort of like uh, uh, has pushed me in the direction of the work that I've decided to do during this period. And I've asked myself this question uh, when we were asked to sort of like photograph, what do we actually want to photograph when the pandemic happened? So I asked myself what will be some of the things that will be important uh, to myself, what were the questions that I asked would be, uh, how am I going to sort of like create a visual record of the pandemic uh, that has happened? Uh, what are the most important pictures to me? So there were three sets of, three bodies of work that were sort of like being created. The first one was keeping the faith. And I think I was very fortunate that um, I had uh, some interest in uh, religious spaces. Uh, turn, as in there was a professor, his name is, he's a friend of mine, Alvin Tan. He suggested that in a paper, he wrote about the growing sort of like transition to digital spaces in terms of how people do their prayers. And that got me very fascinated because, uh, because of the pandemic, you know, with religious spaces of worship being closed, what happens then? There was also another project whereby I wanted to ask about people who do delivery, whether is it delivering goods or delivering people or even delivering hope. Uh, and even with the word deliver in itself, actually... I realized that there's a very strong religious sort of like undertone to it, like uh, to have someone give you or bring something to you uh, in the form of a deliverance. Uh, and that was something I wanted to sort of like capture, capture in this project. Uh, we won't go through that too much because uh, under the theme of the project is a reclusive Ramadan. So uh, the pictures would sort of like reflect during the times of what happened during Ramadan. So that being said, why? I think I, I sort of like touched on that briefly. And I think what was most important was that it was an opportunity to sort of like translate the impact of uh, the global pandemic to this place called home. Like, you think about it, like how um, most of the pictures that when we think about of COVID-19, people would think of immediately masks or people wearing uh, personal protective equipment, gear, PPE. Uh, of course, these pictures are important and they sort of like uh, put you right uh, in the middle of uh, what actually happened, which is basically a global health crisis. But at the same time, the impact of COVID-19 goes beyond. It goes into the religious, it goes into the cultural, it even goes into commerce. So how do we show pictures that show this? How do we sort of like, was there a visual language beyond masks and tapes plastered on the floor? So. I had to look inward and ask myself which, uh, whose voices need to be heard the most and which stories are important to me. So, uh, I think I've mentioned this uh, on this slide. So, here we are with uh, sort of like documenting a reclusive Ramadan. Um, and when you think of Ramadan, which is a time where uh, Muslims globally uh, sort of like take a pause, uh, besides not uh, having food and drink from dusk till dawn, uh, it's also a time of spiritual renewal. It's also a time for uh, communal gatherings. It's, it's a time for uh, acts of charity and uh, understanding what does it mean to be a, a good person and a good Muslim living in the world, uh, a citizen of the world and citizen of uh, a place where you are born. Um, and I think some of the pictures that people sort of like come to acknowledge should be the pictures of uh, Geylang Bazaar with its very bright lights. Uh, some people would sort of like uh, think about Hari Raya whereby it's a time where family come together. So these are the, this is the visual language that we are accustomed to in a way. A very quick search on Google and I think for uh, most people, this is what they are sort of like uh, attuned to. And after a while, you notice that from embarking on the project and trying to think of a visual storyboard to sort of like take the story projects forward, I realized that uh, there were a few themes that kept surfacing. So we're going to jump straight into the pictures. One of it was actually communal spaces and how COVID-19 with the closure of mosques during that period of time really impacted communal spaces. Um, 
I had a very good fortune of meeting Ustaz Muhammad Yusuf Abdul Rahman. So he's 37. And he did the call to prayer at Sultan Mosque uh, early in the morning. Uh, and uh, when I was speaking to the chairman of the mosque and asking him, finding out a bit more of information because I would definitely want to find out more about the mosque and how uh, the mosque sort of like uh, responded to this pandemic. And one of the things that the chairman, uh, Encik Patayal, told me was that uh, we have to continue, we have to continue the call to prayer uh, being broadcast in Kampung Glam. And I asked him why. And his reason was that to ensure that there is still life goes on, hope is being spread through this call to prayer. So I met up with um, Mr. Ustaz Muhammad Yusuf in the morning and uh, I documented him and his time there. Then after that, he said he wanted to do uh, a prayer session. And I think this photograph uh, appears a fair bit uh, with the museum. It's basically an empty prayer hall. And do take note that the last 10 days of Ramadan are actually some of the most uh, important days for uh, a devout Muslim, whereby they would do supplementary prayers, they would read supplications after the pre-dawn prayer. So think about it. This space is pretty empty. It's composed in a very symmetrical manner, but uh, at any point of time, there could be a thousand or even more people on the morning of, uh, uh, or in the morning prayer uh, at Sultan Mosque. So that sense of loss is amplified if the context is known uh, in terms of uh, for Muslims, yeah. So, I think for him, he just needed to. Uh, I think he was just doing his routine uh, after prayers, but at the same time, I I felt the severity of it, and he was joined by the security uh, of that day. So even I still feel sort of like very moved with uh, this sort of like session whereby he is taking time on his own, and I think uh, people would uh, remember that when the outbreak. When the pandemic first started here, I think the biggest clusters were actually religious institutions. I think, uh, I forgot uh, what was the organization, but I think one was a church and definitely the other one was uh, the mosque. And I think they were like the first few sort of like uh, institutions sort of like to close their places of worship when it happened. Yeah. So uh, I think one of it was Kasim Mosque and the manager was Mr. Rahim Ibrahim. So what was really fascinating about this was that uh, he worked together with the government to sort of like create a space for people who uh, were seeking shelter. They were known as rough sleepers. And I think they created a, sh a shelter called the Safe Sound Sleeping Places. Uh, of course, I have to thank uh, the mainstream media for covering this and, and bringing this to attention. But I wanted to sort of like visit Encik Rahim himself and find out how he was uh, coping with the space. So if you see the picture on the left, um, it was the first time he opened the praying hall uh, ever since it got disinfected. <laughs> so he was saying to me before he opened the, the door, he was saying, actually, we have not opened this on that day when they did the disinfection, when they believed that one of the uh, first few super spreaders was actually visiting the mosque, uh, that mosque specifically. So that was something interesting for me, and uh, I thought I would share this narrative with you. And on the right, he was basically doing the daily living inspection uh, checking and... Um, Basically, there are people who uh, uh, are severely impacted from uh, the pandemic in that sense. Yeah. So secondly, it's um, going all the way to the west, which is uh, the main prayer hall of Pusara Aman at Jalan Baha. So you can see it's devoid of congregants. There's a man cleaning the hall, prayer hall. And like I said, a total of 70 mosques in Singapore remain closed during the circuit breaker. Uh, initially, it was just planned for two weeks from March 12th but the closure was extended indefinitely to stem the spread uh, of, the, of the coronavirus. Yeah. And on the right, the mosque chairman, Pusara Aman mosque chairman, Mustafa Kamal Osman, uh, he showed the area whereby it's almost turned into something like a, I would like an like a, like a ops room where you have all the gear that you need to help with uh, their daily tasks. Uh, interesting thing about the mosque is that it is one of the mosques in Singapore whereby they would sort of like help with uh, funeral arrangements. So uh, they had to crew change certain parts of the mosque so that there is operationally, it makes sense for people to come in uh, to sort of like uh, pay their last respects uh, to, the, to the date. And it was during the circuit breaker. So can you imagine for families who lost someone and the, sort of like the work that has to be done through that. So I thought it was quite 
uh, interesting for me. Yeah. So some of these images do not appear in the museum. Uh, I just wanted to show uh, some of the things that were sort of like were, were photographed but were not included. Um, at the same time with the closure of the mosque, uh, it can also be said that um, there was no sort of like, uh, one of the traditions that everyone looked forward to was actually collecting the porridge uh, that is sort of like uh, donated to the public, and especially the needy. So with mosques not doing that, we have uh, FMB establishments like Al Fala Baraka, which is beside Juchet Complex. Uh, the owner decided if no one's going to step in or he didn't see anyone stepping, he's going to step in. He says that I'm going to get my staff to create this wonderful porridge for uh, people to have during the fasting month. And you could see that by like 3 p.m., uh, the queue was being formed already for people to collect. And he did it for free. He did it uh, as a way to uh, sort of like respect the month of Ramadan. Besides communal spaces, I wanted to sort of like highlight important visual markers when it comes to uh, uh, photographing a project like this. I think when people or the community know about, and personally, I wouldn't say I speak on behalf of all the community, but it's based on my lived experience and also the experience that I have with my family members and my uh, relatives, that there are spaces and places that people look forward to. And one of it was actually Sultan Mosque. And during the circuit breaker, the Sultan Mosque was uh, really a ghost town especially during the month of Ramadan. And traditionally, even before uh, Gelang Bazaar, um, Kabung Gelam was actually the place for people to sort of like be um, for Ramadan with delicious food and bazaar style, creating a bustling atmosphere. So at the same time also, we talk about uh, people looking forward to visiting uh, the Gelang Sarai area, whereby uh, places like Juchek Complex and uh, the funny thing was that all the lights were, all the sort of like installations were all set up, but the problem was that not, it was not switched on. Uh, so it was a very surreal and very eerie sort of like atmosphere whereby you had this sort of like, you were one step away from celebrating uh, the occasion, but the lights weren't on. Uh, interestingly, <laughs> the lights did come on, but for just one and a half hours, if I'm not wrong, on the, on the last night of Ramadan, I think it was reported that it was switched on from 8.20pm to 10pm. I think that was the time where they switched it on. Maybe people were driving by, they wanted to have a sense of celebration. So that was something that I felt was interesting to sort of like document. Another thing which was important was actually the Gelang Sarai market itself, uh, as in uh, the food centre at the top. Normally by 7pm, that place will be packed because everyone will be having a seat and they will be ready to break their fast. But for uh, Mr. Said Sultanul Abidin Abdul Mutaif, he decided to call it a day because uh, there are no customers on a Friday night. Most of the customers would come in to do delivery or takeaway. Uh, and they said that, you know, every night on Ramadan nights, there will be a festive buzz and... Uh, they will be, it will be a bustling feeling. Like, you know, it will be a, a feeling of being gathered around people. And I think that's the thing with uh, something like the coronavirus where uh, it cripples, it, feels a, it has a crippling effect of you sort of like being away from uh, people around you. So he mentioned also that the revenues have dropped almost 80% uh, during the start of Circuit Breaker. However, uh, business started picking up once they went digital and they took online orders and provide delivery service. So you can see the metal of some of these organizations and businesses where they decided to pivot and to find another revenue stream. Yeah? Of course, uh, another important visual marker is the Gelang Serai market itself, where if you were to ask any machi, <laughs> they would tell you that the place that they want to be to do their grocery shopping would still be Gelang Serai market. Uh, and it's more of because uh, the availability or just the comfort and the sort of like the banter that they get with the people working there. It's not so much whereby they... W of course, you would want to have a more convenient solution, but they would still want to visit uh, one way or another. So you could see the snaking queues uh, as early as 7 a.m. And this was the last weekend uh, before Hari Raya Adi uh, which was, I think, about exactly a year ago, uh, the, the last night of Ramadan. Uh, yes, of course they have to go temperature screening and everything. So you could see uh, the effects of the virus and this is one way whereby uh, the, the erection of barriers uh, sort of like indicate the presence of a pandemic happening and what people have to do to sort of like ensure 
uh, uh, everyone's safety. Yeah. Taking it forward, I think what was important for me was telling stories. Telling stories of people who have found ways to sort of like uh, overcome or help others to cope with the, uh, with the pandemic. So one such story was actually the brothers Muhammad Zul Fizwan and Zul Fadli. Uh, I got to know them through a friend and they decided to run a quick business whereby they would do delivery from Gilang Surai. So they were, their concern was that all these elderly folk that were visiting, they were worried that they might be uh, uh, infected with the virus and they might fall sick. So he said, no, you, all of you stay at home, we will help you with the deliveries. Uh, when they started out, I think it was uh, small orders, but on the last weekend before uh, Hari Raya, I think they got almost like, like 10 orders that day and they were really trying to figure out how to separate the ops between the two of them, visiting home to home. Uh, so this is one such example. Uh, this was from the Project Deliver, not Reclusive Ramadan. Uh, the second one is, of course, the story of retired cleaner Zukifli uh, Atnawi. So for him, uh, he actually decided to become something like what we call a Ketua Kampung or a village chief or Kampung chief, whereby he was very worried about the condition, about what's happening to his neighbours during the circuit breaker, whether they... Are they coping? Are they not coping? So he would actually go door to door outside the window and take orders. Together with his children, uh, they created this organization called Project Hills. And the work that Project Hills does is tremendous in the way that they want to sort of like provide support, but not in a way that uh, people uh, don't understand because uh, of their background. They understand what does it mean to provide help uh, from the point of view of a family that, has, that is uh, less privileged than others. So uh, do check uh, Project Hills. They, I think they have a Facebook page somewhere. So uh, he organises uh, grocery runs and I think sometimes he would feel a bit sad because people would think that he's actually hoarding food when he's not. Uh, and he would tell his children, that, you know, never mind if people judge us or comment us, but he said that we have a job to do and we have to do it well. So they would make the walk back to their uh, two-room rental flat at Block 155 Mailing Street. And from there, they would sort of like start to distribute. Uh, and they also get a fair bit of generous support from organisations who say, we want to help, can we help in some way? So in their living room, is really like, a, like I said, an ops room again, where they will organise their purchases with some donations. And uh, they will pack them into big red plastic bags and they would distribute them. So each bag will have staples like rice, tea bags, condensed milk, cooking oil, washing detergent, and a care pack, yeah. Um, so for, once they've done that, they will actually go to the different blocks and they will do the distribution and they will give also a voucher of $100 uh, for people to use when they go to the supermarket. The other thing that I was interested in for this project was actually the negotiation between the digital and the physical, uh, especially in the realm of religion. Uh, and commerce. I think most of you would know that for the second year running, the Gilang Serai Bazaar, uh, which would have thousands of people visiting, has gone online. And uh, for Hyrule Nizam Ramli, I think for him, uh, he was getting ready for the Hari Raya Bazaar. I think he had already bought a lot of stock. He had a lot of um, things that he wanted to sell, but all this sort of like turned wayward when the pandemic hit. So right now, with just a smartphone and a ring light, he would do live sessions whereby he would be selling clothes to the customers. You know, you can hear him say, like and share, like and share. And he would try to engage with uh, his customers online. So uh, this year, that year, I mean, 2020, would be his fourth year partic participating in the bazaar. Uh, and he said that, you know, it, the challenge was really trying to cope with multiple personalised inquiries over different platforms and handling exchange and returns. And you can imagine, like, you know, uh, their customer service will be probably answering all the messages that they have on either Instagram or Facebook and then keeping track of the uh, purchases and who goes what where. I think from a religious point of view, uh, I wanted to sort of like highlight the work of uh, uh, Moes. Uh, so for example, on the left, uh, Ustaz Mahmoud Mathlub Siddiq, 
delivers his Friday prayer sermon in a studio inside Brita Haryan, which is Singapore's main Malay language broadsheet. So, um, with mosques being closed and no one could attend the sort of like important uh, weekly Friday prayers, people wanted to find a way to sort of like still be connected to uh, the community and pray communally in that sense. So, these sermons will be done uh, and will be sort of like broadcast uh, at the timings of the Friday prayers, which was uh, a fairly innovative sort of like movement from uh, the from Muiz actually. Uh, so they launched a YouTube channel called Salam SG TV uh, a few days before the fasting month of Ramadan. Mm. And um, by the time of June 2020, it already reached 15,000 subscribers. So you can see that people were actually hungry for uh, sort of like in a way religious content uh, contextualized to Singapore uh, so that they could continue with their, with their faith. Uh, the other sort of like photograph that is actually on display in the museum is the photograph of uh, Mufti Dr. Naziruddin Muhammad Nasir. Uh, and for him, he was preparing uh, to announce the beginning of the month of Shawal and Hari Raya Idi Fitri uh, to broadcast on various media and channels. Yeah. So uh, for, for him and the challenges faced by his team uh, ever since he took office, uh, it's actually pretty pretty astounding uh, but uh, yeah so um, I thought it was important to highlight him as the face of the community uh, to sort of like bring the challenge forward and to take this challenge head on at the same time when we talk about Ramadan we will talk about the Muslims and most of us will be familiar with the Muslims that we have within our circle of friends whether is it uh, our Malay friends or our Indian friends but at the same time uh, because of the work that I've done before, I was very interested in sort of like looking at uh, uh, Muslims that were working here, basically the migrant workers. So one of the things that I was interested in was the migrant workers living in uh, these special dorms, uh, factory converted dormitories to be specific. So uh, early in the morning, I went to a central kitchen in Sunoco uh, with a charity organization called Free Food, of All, Free Food for All. So they were packing food that was suitable to the palate of the migrant workers from South Asia. And there was sort of like a debate whereby uh, they would get these meals, which is just me goreng. And I think their palate is totally different from the palate of uh, uh, the Muslims here in Singapore. So they were very clear in terms of providing uh, nutritious food for the morning meal, which most Muslims would have. We wake up very early to have our morning meal by 5. Uh, and roughly about 5.30, we'll start our fast all the way till about 7. So for, can you imagine if you are not able to move, you are stuck in a, in a, in a place and you do not have the kind of same nutritious food uh, as everyone else. Uh, that's not just the problem. The other problem is also the idea of community and um, the, the lack of it. And I think it was a very interesting and challenging year for uh, migrant workers who... Muslim migrant workers last year. So I wanted to ensure that this was actually documented uh, at that period. Yeah. Um, free, food for, free Food for All managed to raise almost 100,000 so that these meals during Ramadan remain free for the migrant workers. So something to take note. Yeah. The other thing that was said in my mind was actually trying to find pictures of migrant workers who were actually inside the what we call community care facility. I just wanted to be sure that I got it right. Yeah, so uh, they are meant for COVID-19 patients with relatively mild or no symptoms and do not require extensive medical intervention. Uh, I remember preparing to enter this, uh, working with the Ministry of Defence uh, and um, this forward-thinking civil servant who said that it was important to get images like this so that we show the work of uh, the, uh, the, the, the relevant department and that they're looking after the migrant workers. And I thought that, you know, to have these pictures come to light was actually very important. Uh, so when I was there, uh, I was also fasting and I was also trying to ask myself, how do these people know when was the call to fast? Uh, as in, when would they know when to break fast? And uh, magically enough, when the time happened, this gentleman here, he started doing the call to prayer. I think you remember the first slide where I showed the call to prayer inside the mosque. He decided to do the call to prayer and inside that uh, hall, it's one of the halls, I didn't write it down. He decided to do the call to prayer which, was, which meant the time to come to prayer and also the, which meant for you to breakfast which is basically water and a date. 
and here they are uh, in one of the halls uh, they decided to uh, usually when we do sort of like the communal prayers, it will be uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, and uh, in sort of like many rows. So I can see roughly probably about 100 Muslim migrant workers who were performing the evening prayers. Uh, and of course, uh, whoever that was running the Singapore Expo Community Care Facility decided to create a space for them to do their prayers, which was actually very remarkable. Uh, there were jokes around. My, some of my friends were saying that, oh, you know, Ramadan, I don't get to do my nightly prayers with my friends, you know, in the thousands. Then I was joking that actually you can, but you have to be COVID-19 positive. Uh, and, you know, then you can have your <laughs> prayer inside here, which uh, is an option, but no, I, I think we were just, uh, just teasing. Yeah? So, um, this was the image that uh, I really wanted to show and really wanted to photograph uh, of um, the Muslim migrant workers in Singapore and how they uh, and the challenges that they went through with their, with their Ramadan in 2020. Ultimately, Ramadan is about faith and Ramadan is about uh, time with family. And I think um, there was this sort of like a return to the fundamentals whereby uh, beyond Ramadan, whereby it's celebrated outwardly where you are doing many things, where the, uh, whether you have the bazaars or something or basically the communal prayers inside the mosque. Uh, in a way, the home has become the mosque for a lot of families, uh, whereby they sort of like rediscovered uh, praying with each other. So for example, uh, freelance tutor Nurasha Hassan and her husband Zulkifli Muhammad uh, kindly allowed me to enter their homes to sort of like photograph them doing the nightly Taraweh prayers, um, congregational uh, Traway prayers um, and these are special prayers performed only during Ramadan and usually done in large groups at mosques um, and they would share that you know previously they would go um, to other mosques to do their nightly prayers and you know it, uh, they would invite their neighbours over and it was like I said a very communal experience whereby you really you know look after your neighbour and you spend time together but because of the restrictions from the pan uh, big caused by the pandemic uh, these are some of the ways that they decided to sort of like take it forward. Uh, I was also very thankful to be around family uh, with a freelance family counsellor, Azhana Nikames. Uh, she and her family decided to organise uh, sort of like um, a, set, a Zoom session on the night, on, uh, on the last night of Ramadan, uh, whereby um, they would do the takbir or the communal prayer calls uh, followed by well wishes from 18 uh, participants to mark the start of Hari Raya Adifitri the day after. Yeah? So, um, of course, the Muiz announced that, you know, uh, there should be no Adifitri visits or gatherings during the circuit breaker period. Uh, period. So, they decided to do this tool as an alternative for traditional visits and gatherings during this festive period, which I thought was both... Um, was both happy and both a uh, sad moment as well. Uh, like, you know, you, you are in the presence of these families and they let you in and you try to sort of like figure out their emotions and go, what they are going through. And I think it's not easy um, uh, to be away from family during a, a period of celebration. So, um, overall, it's... Uh, and, and finally, uh, on the morning of uh, Hari Raya Adifitri, where we would have um, the eat prayer, uh, uh, Madam Azanani's uh, husband, uh, Muhammad Azman, would, uh, he decided to lead the prayer and also give a sermon um, where 17 more still remain closed. He would perform and he was also very actively involved in the Darul Gufran Mosque. So for him, he perfectly understood the reason why but at the same time, I think for a lot of people, uh, it was a difficult emotion to square away at the same time. Sorry, just taking some time to think about last year. Yeah. So, but at the same time, I think what was evident was that um, the challenge for the Muslims to go through was tremendous, but at the same time, it was our challenge to keep. Uh, it was a challenge whereby we understood what does it mean to uh, celebrate uh, or to understand, to, to observe the fast in a way. And I think a lot of people sort of like make the mistake of fasting as or during the month of Ramadan as just be, being without water and food. Uh, it's actually more than that. It's a, a test of your uh, metal. It's a test of who you are as a person. Uh, and uh, it's sort of like 
a chance for you to look inwardly and become a better person. And I thought, uh, with my limited ability to sort of like take pictures and to understand stories, I thought this was important to sort of like highlight. Uh, and at the same time, you could see that, you know, whenever I meet people in specific spaces, people were hungry for human connection. Uh, the pandemic did that, whereby it isolated us, it made us sort of like go away from our communal gatherings. But at the same time, uh, the desire to connect is actually a very human thing. Uh, and I thought that was something I want to sort of like leave it there. Uh, I just want to highlight this again, all the organizations that helped me, all the people and individuals that helped me. I think some of you are watching. Uh, uh, I don't say it enough, but a deep, sincere thanks uh, for allowing me into your lives and your family and uh, to photograph you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Zakaria, for the very insightful sharing about the lives of the Muslim community uh, as you went around photographing um, their experience during Ramadan. Um, we do have quite a number of questions, but I think first of all, I think I would, as you were talking, right, I think I was just reflecting upon my own experience last year um, during the circuit breaker and my, and my own religious experience because I'm Catholic and I remember celebrating Easter last year. Um, also, I, we were not able to go to church, you know, so um, it was quite a sad moment because usually for Easter, it's really a very joyous occasion. Um, at least my family, we were all gathered together, have a meal, you know, uh, with my extended family. So um, I think that's something that really struck me personally about as you were sharing about um, your own experience and your experience of uh, photographing as well. So I think uh, one of the questions that we do have is, uh, what were the emotions that you were going through um, as you were documenting these scenes, you know, as you were seeing mm. um, all this happening unfold right before your eyes? So, oh, I'm still alive. Okay, uh, do I look here? I look here. So, I think uh, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful question to ask, and I think uh, a lot of the religious communities in Singapore uh, felt probably the same way. Uh, it wasn't sort of like so squarely a, a, a Muslim experience. Uh, in a way, I was very task-oriented because um, I, was, I only started working 10 days <laughs> uh, before <laughs> the, the end of Ramadan, so I was racing against time. Uh, and, but at the same time, I think it was a just nice amount of time for me to sort of like uh, uh, keep my focus and decide what is important and what was not. Of course, there were stories that I wanted to have. Uh, for example, there was this, uh, if I'm not wrong, he was a Bangladeshi migrant worker and he gave sermons, religious sermons in uh, the Bangladeshi language, uh, which was fascinating from his room. I thought that would be something great to follow, but it fell through. My emotions uh, when I'm working is fairly steady because I knew that I had to be there to work. But I think it's only after that I, I, I reflect or when I, uh, I put in a lot of effort with the captions, as you can see, I try to be as detailed or to give context to the the readers so that they know that at this specific moment of time, this is what happened uh, and the story behind it. I think then I felt like, wow, like, you know, uh, pretty, uh, pretty overwhelmed with emotion. Uh, probably the last night or the, the last night um, and the morning of Ramadan, because that will be where we do the takbir, which is basically the uh, communal calls to prayer. Uh, that was when I felt a bit emotional whereby, like, you know, you, 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 you wish to uh, be around your family especially my parents. Uh, yeah, so that was probably the only time where I, I felt emotional. But I had a very good support uh, network through the team. Uh, and my wife, of course, like, you know, because we have each other, so I think I, I felt a special shout-out to her for uh, keeping me steady <laughs> throughout this entire time documenting. But thank you for the question, yeah. Yeah, thanks, uh, Zakaria. Yeah, I think it's very important to have support network, I think especially last year. I think even now, you know, um, that we are asked to stay at home. <laughs> I think it's important to have that network. So would you say that um, as you're going through um, this experience, um, it also kind of mirrored your personal experience of celebrating Ramadan last year? W was it similar to how you observed everyone else doing? Uh, I think first and foremost, um, I'm very privileged in the sense that I have a roof over my head. I have my own space. Uh, my parents are highly dependent and they give me space to do what I want to do. So to have that kind of uh, privilege is actually uh, amazing. Um, 
but yet at the same time, like, you know, I wouldn't think that it would mirror the experience of a lot of other uh, uh, Muslims who are a bit more needy, um, who require a bit more help, uh, either from a commerce point of view or uh, I think I think some would remember the home baking businesses were affected severely uh, when there was like sort of like uh, slight policy changes or they were not un they were not clear in terms of what the the policy was. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, um, but at the same time, I think it sort of like underscored the impact of the pandemic uh, at an economic and a societal level, uh, whereby uh, visually it can be very difficult to highlight because um, people will often rely on a very sort of like immediate, I want to see a photo of a pandemic, it will be uh, uh, one, two, three, four, which is basically mass uh, uh, people dying or something like that. Uh, but how do you sort of like photograph um, economic sort of like hardship? I think that's another thing altogether. Or people sort of like changing the way they do businesses, that's another thing. So, uh, in a way, I hope I've, I've answered that question, but I think uh, just a, a bit of uh, digression. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's perfect. Thank you, fine. Fabian. Yeah. Um, do you have any favourite photographs from, your from what you've taken, and why is it your favourite? Anything that, really favorite, you, uh, that you really like or is most memorable to you? Mm, I mean, it's not fair to uh, say one child is more favourite than the other. No, uh, in a way, they, they all have their importance at their own period of time. So I think if I were put it under the category, uh, the f as in either it's an important visual marker or faith of family, I think some of this uh, I've highlighted. I, I think it would be tough to, to, to put on one. But the most difficult one will be the f ones that I photographed at the community care facility because I was quite clear that I wanted that. So I think I spent almost a week trying to get an hour of access. So um, I had to learn how to wear the PPE. I had to go to Nissan camp. Uh, so in a way, the most difficult picture to get, but the one that I really wanted to was uh, of the migrant Muslims praying. Uh, I think that was important to me. Yeah, but it, it's interesting that you had to learn how to do to wear the safety gear and all that. So, um, curiously, was there any moment during this time uh, when you were out photographing that you were, you felt afraid uh, because mm. of the virus? Um, and how do you cope with it? Or um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So I think I mentioned somewhere that um, when you want to take pictures, right? You have to be you have to be present. You cannot like. Of course, there are some who are a bit more innovative than me who can do shoots over Zoom. I can't, I don't know, I'm, I think I'm a bit old school in that sense. So I have to be there. Uh, yeah, I would always think that, oh, like, you know, what if this person has it or what if I'm in that room in the Singapore Expo and I get exposed or something happens and I come back, you know, it's, I'm going home to my wife or what should I do? But you compare that to the experience of the frontliners who do that on a daily basis, I think... Yeah, I think I have I, I, I felt scared, but I don't think uh, it should be magnified. La. I think it's just me doing my work. Yeah. Mm. yeah but Sorry, I should be looking there. Yeah, but uh, really thank you for doing this, uh, going out there and really taking those photographs. Thank the museum also. Thank you uh, <laughs> and the team. Yeah. Actually, so we have another question is, um, were you able to talk to any of the migrant workers to find out how they felt uh, observing Ramadan in this uh, different manner? So for the, I think language might be a barrier, but at the same time, they understood plain English. Uh, I think um, the only time I had the interaction with them uh, was actually inside the community care facility. And even then, it was quite brief because uh, I wanted to be sure that I would go in and take the photographs that I need and I, I, I would need to leave because uh, I was also trying to observe my fast and I didn't want to stay for too long and break fast. It's encouraged that you break fast almost immediately. So I was trying to figure out how am I going to break fast without, like, I was still wearing my PPE, right? It was all covered. So I can't be, like, opening everything and just eating, right? So I had to take the pictures, go out, uh, remove my PPE, then I could break fast properly. So that was one interaction. Uh, I, managed to, uh, uh, I managed to ask him how long he was there briefly and everything, but... Uh, it was difficult because I was holding on to my camera. I didn't have like a notepad or something like that. 
uh, I wish I was a bit more prepared uh, going inside the community care facility and in terms of what I wanted to document. Uh, so that was one interaction. The other one was uh, a bit difficult because we were distributing food at different uh, factory converted dormitories. So that one was a bit tricky and it was also very early in the morning and I didn't want to take up their time because the moment they receive their meals for their morning meal, they probably want to go and have their morning meal. I think it would not be sort of like right for me to interview them and then before you know it, we have to fast already. Yeah. So that was some of the tricky part lah, as someone who wanted to work on this project but still had to go through the rigours of fasting. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, we have a question. Um, this person really liked your documentation of Project Hills. Uh, it was really a message of delivering hope and joy during uh, those trying times. So what is one message that struck with you as you documented last year's uh, reclusive Ramadan? Overall or with Project Hope? Um, oh, Project Hills, I mean. Project, uh, overall. Overall, what was... I think I said it at the end that uh, the pandemic had, uh, had a very crippling effect in terms of uh, the Muslim community whereby it's very commun communal driven. I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of communities are in the sense, but when you think about the practices inside the mosque, prayers are done together, uh, in, in, in rows, close shoulder to shoulder, you break fast together, uh, the iftar or the buka puasa, people sit down and eat, uh, collecting uh, distribution of alms, uh, all that was gone, it was closed. So can you imagine, like, you know, uh, unless, if you don't have a big family, or it, even if you had an extended family, you can't see them also, so you're just on your own. Um, so it's almost to the point of despair. Uh, I, I, as in, I don't want to couch it as, as bad as it seems, but it is, like, you know, so, um, and also, what if you are in homes whereby it's not conducive or it's abusive, so uh, difficult to, uh, difficulty with families or whatever, uh, yet at the same time, I think people found ways to sort of like build up their resiliency and to figure out how they're going to sort of like move forward with life and how they're going to do it. Uh, and also the, the efforts of many ground out initiatives like WES or uh, Mutual Aid, uh, they all started popping up and sort of like helping. And, and I think that's uh, really showing the, the spirit of people uh, when it comes to difficult times, lah, I think. I think really, uh, we really need more of that uh, mutual help, especially even this year, yeah, uh, as we go through um, these coming months. So uh, maybe um, the, perhaps we can uh, ask a question. So we have someone who asks, um, where can they view your work, actually? Do you, do you have your on any online viewing platform oh, uh, uh, for your work? You mean... Uh, the photographs. The photographs of this project? Yeah. Do you, do you I have not <laughs> put it online as yet. Uh, I'm still... I think you can come to the museum. Uh, I think uh, the museum will be very uh, happy with that. I think that's where it's uh, best viewed at the moment um, because of the curation and the context and also uh, the work of the other talented photographers uh, uh, for picturing the pandemic as well as the filmmakers. I think it's worth a visit. Uh, Probably six months later, I'll probably put it out on my website uh, so that I can make sense of uh, all these pictures that I've taken. There are still some that are hidden. I want to have a, a second look again, but uh, these are the ones that I feel tell the best story at the moment. Yeah, so for our viewers out there, um, if you're interested to look at Zakaria's work, um, the museum is open, still open right now. So um, you can visit. Um, but of course, if you're, you, you can visit maybe after when the situation stabilizes. But um, the exhibition, the picture in the pandemic, will run up till 29th of August. So, uh, maybe, so, so now maybe we can uh, look into the future, maybe a bit like a speculation. Um, so we have a question. Um, would you foresee a change in normalcy of how the community will celebrate Ramadan in the future? Wow. This is very challenging because I'm on record. <laughs> uh, you mean because of the uh, whether Ramadan will be celebrated differently because of the pandemic, lah? Yeah. Like, would it would we be return back to normal? Oh, return back to normal. Yeah, in the future. In the future. I think with almost every aspect of society, um, there is already this idea that things are not going back to normal. Uh, but even if we sort of like move towards that, we know we have that that kind of muscle memory to go back to. 
and I don't think it'll be as painful as when we did it the first time. Uh, there will be measures in place. We'll know what to say. Probably, uh, bet we can uh, be more better use of technology and so on and so forth. So in a way, I think it will be affected. But I guess if, uh, like, say for example, like this year, I think um, when the heightened measures were announced on, if I'm not wrong, uh, 14, uh, and then uh, Raya was on the 16. Uh, or some, I, I'm missing out my dates, but when, when the measures were, were, were announced, right, I think people were sad, but at the same time, I thought it was a moment of victory for people who uh, were able to go to the mosque, to be able to do the trial prayers, to be able to see each other, uh, amid, even though the measures were in place. And I thought, like, wow, what a victory as compared to the year before when everything was closed. And the sadness was so evident because this were the, the, the house of God, for, I think for other religions also, like, you know, was empty. And uh, for me, that was the one that I felt was important. I think we will adapt, but at the same time, uh, this year, being able to do things that we, we couldn't have done last year because of Circuit Breaker was actually a, a very big win. And kudos to uh, the mosque and, the organi and all the people who organise uh, inside the mosque, to Moes, I think they have done a tremendous job to sort of like keep hopes going. Uh, for this year, yeah. Great. Uh, so one last question. Uh, so someone asked, um, do you have, what's your next project? <laughs> do you have any <laughs> other COVID-19 related projects? I realise that every time I'll do this sort of like session, people ask, what's the next project? Uh, I have no idea. Like, you know, for me, it's like, um, with every project, you, you, you give a lot of yourself to the project. Um, of course, uh, it would not have been possible without the support of the museum and, of course, uh, the curating team, Daniel and team, uh, Vidya, and a few others I missed out, I'm sorry. Uh, Gwen also who commissioned me the work. Uh, and, you know, to have, the, to have faith uh, uh, in me sort of like executing it, I think. Um, and also during a very, very interesting time, which was the circuit breaker uh, period. Uh, maybe when... Uh, Maybe when I have a bit more fresher eyes that I could see differently, something new might turn up. But at the moment, I think I'll just reflect on this and uh, see what happens. Mm. Yeah, so thank you very much, Zakaria. So um, that really uh, is the end of um, this presentation by Zakaria. So for those of you who are at home or wherever you are watching this, perhaps you can all give, us, give him a nice applause from wherever you are for really sharing with us uh, intimately about... I can um, hear the his, applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, sharing with us intimately um, the stories behind the photos that he took uh, during last year's uh, reclusive Ramadan. And I think it's really, really, very meaningful um, um, what he, um, the sharing that he did. Right, so uh, for all those of you at home, so please remember there will be a special giveaway that we will be doing. So please look out for a link in the post below. Uh, you can click on the link and the top three entries okay, will actually stand a chance uh, to win a special giveaway. They are actually a set. We are giving away a set of uh, exclusive souvenirs from our two special exhibitions, Home Truly as well as Picturing the Pandemic. So um, in this uh, souvenir set, we're actually giving away two um, of Zakaria's uh, photographs okay, that, um, that, was, that appeared uh, just now. Right, so it's a postcard that you can keep uh, you know, and uh, remember as well. And for all of those at home, um, if you want to find out more about our programs, please do follow us on Facebook or Instagram to be kept up to date with our latest programs. Other than that, thank you very much for tuning in. And stay safe, everyone. And have a lovely day. Bye.